Hello and welcome to Americans Learn. My name is Lauren and today I am going to be looking at a fat electrician video. This one is World War Tree. Uh, this one was requested by channel member Joe Fravel. Thank you so very much for requesting it. Um, and one of the perks of the membership that Joe's got is that uh, you can request any video um, and we will post it uh, day of or day after the initial request is seen. So this is going up early just for Joe. Thanks again. I'm really excited to get into it. I've been enjoying all the fat electrician videos that I have seen. Um, so yeah, just go ahead and let me know if there's more that you'd like me to do. And now without any further ado at all, World War III, Operation Paul Bunyan. Ah uh, yes, that time that North Korea told America that we couldn't trim a tree and America was legitimately ready to start World War III about it. World War Tree, if you will. All right, starting off with a bang or a quack bang as, as the case might be. I definitely thought, I had no idea Korea would be involved. Today we're talking about the Korean ax murder incident and America's response to that incident Operation Paul Bunyan. But first, this video is brought to you by the two biggest sponsors of the channel. We've got Zydex, okay. custom gaming PCs, computers built right here in America with American-made tech support, and they have a lifetime warranty. They can build you anything you want to any spec you want, but also they have some that are already pre-built and ready to ship. And then of course, my favorite sporting goods store, Shields. They've got over 30 amazing retail locations all across the United States. I'm not just saying that because they're giving me money. It's legitimately the best sporting goods store I've ever set foot in. But if you don't live near one of the retail locations, they have an even better online store with price matching and satisfaction guaranteed mm. i'm gonna have links and discount codes for both those sponsors in the description down below and on my website thefatelectrician.com let's get back to the video all right once upon a time july 1953 north and south korean leadership would meet in a small village known as punjong right near the 38th parallel where they would sign an armistice that would technically only pause but essentially end the korean war from this moment oh. forward we have the official military demarcation line essentially the line in the sand separating north and south korea Surrounding that demarcation line is a two and a half mile wide, 160 mile long buffer zone known as the DMZ, the Demilitarized Zone. And that's pretty much it. The Iron Curtain goes up, North Korea becomes the world's largest secret society, and the entire world gets to stand by and watch as there is a competition between capitalism and communism to see which one is actually better. And well, 70 years later, the results are visible from outer space. Ugh! Wait, let me guess. You're going to say that's not real communism. Well, now I wanted to that is a lot of non no light I don't know if that says that nor that I don't think that answers the question of capitalism or communism is better this just answers North Korea doesn't have a lot of bright lights which might mean that they have those lights that like angle down and they don't go up into the sky and waste a bunch of light or it might just mean that's just kind of terrifying. That's just kind of very scary. <laughs> ah! Wait, let me guess. You're going to say that's not real communism. Well, I'll tell you what. Every time anything bad happens under capitalism, I'm just going to respond by saying, oh, well, that's not real capitalism. How about that's OK? You can do that. Why not? Go for it. Sure. I don't see any problem with that at all. That. Buh. Yeah, that's what I thought. Anyways, <laughs> that village where the treaty was signed would go on to become the JSA or the Joint Security Area. And in theory, this was supposed to be the only point where North and South Korean forces could intermingle. The North Koreans could pass the armistice line into South Korea and vice versa, provided everybody stayed within the confines of this particular village. Obviously, the point of having a place like this was so that everybody could have a place to exchange prisoners, have peace talks, what have you. But naturally, the intermingling of North Korean and UN forces over the course of time would lead to a bunch of fights breaking out. Luckily, they that foresaw tracks. this coming and there was very strict rules about having firearms inside of the JSA and generally speaking nobody really ever had them on them. Despite that there were so many skirmishes so often that the UN would try to get North Korea to agree that they should still abide by the demarcation line, North Koreans stay on their half of the JSA, and South Korean and UN forces stay on their half of the JSA. North Korea consistently refused. And that's all the background info you How need. How very, so forward, very, I'll like, siblings sharing a room, except for much more dangerous. But, like, that's just, in every sitcom ever, you have, like, the, the, the thing where the siblings put the line down the middle of the room, and it's like, you can't leave your side, I'm staying on my side. And you always have the one who, like, just plays around, sneaks around to the other side of the line, you know. 
And then you always have the other one whose side of the room is next to the door so they can get out. That that little phenomena. August 6, 1976. Inside the JSA, there's a bridge. That bridge is called the Bridge of No Return because once you cross that bridge, you not only cross the military demarcation line, but you also cross the border to the JSA, meaning that you are now inside of North Korea, hence the name, the Bridge of No Return. As you can yeah. see here on the JSA side of the bridge, there is military checkpoint three. As I'm sure you can imagine, that's very important because, well, if the North Koreans are going to attack, they're probably going to incorporate that bridge somehow. They've got a military observation post right there. If the North Koreans are coming, they're going to send off the warning. Next thing you know, all of America knows that you're here. Now all of the UN knows that you're here. All right, but the problem is right next to checkpoint Masterful. three, there's a big ass 100 foot high poplar tree. And that tree is blocking the vision from all the other checkpoints from being able to see checkpoint three, meaning that in theory, the North Koreans could invade, take out checkpoint three, build up a big enemy force while using this tree as cover, and then take out the rest of the JSA. So this tree is a security issue. We got to get rid of it. Okay, so this is not a big deal whatsoever. That tree is inside the JSA. It's on the South Korean side. So it's technically in South Korea. So they send out some South Korean soldiers with some axes. They're going to go chop down this tree. That's going to be the end of it. Location of poplar tree and axe murders. Great. Great. I did rem I do remember he mentioned axe murdering as a thing that happened in this story, but I kind of got forgot already. No big deal whatsoever. Then the North Koreans show up being dicks and they're like, no, you're not allowed to cut this tree down because we said so. That's why. And the South Koreans are like, what? Okay, well, I'm gonna go get the Americans and then we're gonna come back and then we're all gonna cut down the tree together. Bye. All right, fast forward a couple weeks, August 18th, 1976. This time, a 15-man working party comprised of Americans and South Koreans show up at this tree to cut it down. And once again, the North Koreans show up almost immediately. This time, there's 11 of them and they are being led by an officer nicknamed the Bulldog because he is well-known and has a reputation for starting shit inside the JSA and instigating a bunch of fights. He then proceeds to tell the Americans that they have to stop trimming that tree because that particular poplar tree was planted by none other than Kim Il-sung, the founder of North Korea. To which the Americans, oh. I'm paraphrasing, obviously, but they were like, oh, really? Did he? He planted this tree? Kim Il-sung, the same guy that you guys think invented the hamburger and the burrito. <laughs> and the first time he ever golfed, he golfed a 38 under par with 11 hole in ones. And his body is so efficient that he doesn't have to use the bathroom because he doesn't generate waste. That guy, he. That's stuff that, oh my. People will believe anything. <laughs> People will believe anything. Good God. He planted this tree. I don't give a shit. So they turned around and kept cutting Good. down this tree. So at this point, Officer Bulldog sends a runner across the bridge and no return into North Korea. A couple minutes later, two trucks show up with 30 more North Korean soldiers and they all get out with clubs. At this point, Officer Bulldog tells the working party again, stop cutting down the tree or else and the working party under the impression they're not actually going to do anything ignores them and just keeps cutting down the tree at which point officer bulldog famously takes off his watch wraps it in a another takes off his watch took his watch off wrapped it in a handkerchief and placed it in his pocket oh god that's like very hold my beer isn't it another kpa kpa officer rolled up his sleeves see captain bontifoss was observing the tree cutting and did not notice these actions by the KPA 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 officers oh my god Jesus a handkerchief sets it down and yells chukyo meaning kill in North Korean at which point all of the soldiers attacked the members of the working party. Every member of the working party was injured and two Americans were killed. Shit has officially hit the fan. The entire U.S. military is put on DEFCON 3, which is the highest level of readiness that the military can go to without actually being at war. The president and the Joint Chiefs of Staff are dragged into the bunker underneath the White House to begin getting briefed by the CIA, and North Korea is shitting its pants because a couple of their guys just may have kicked off World War 3. Within four Over hours, a tree! Over a issue a public statement trying to pin the entire thing on America, saying the Americans that were there instigated the entire thing and it's their fault. Then North- I mean, like, usually that would be true, but it doesn't seem like it was true this time. They just said, no, screw your guy. I'm gonna cut down this tree. It's not like a sacred tree. 
It's a tree. He, plant he probably planted. If he planted this tree, he planted other trees. Go have fun with that one. North Korean leadership goes before the non-aligned nations committee, which for the purposes of this story, just think of it as like not NATO. Here's NATO. Here's the non-aligned nations. You get the idea. They then try to pass a resolution that says they should all condemn America for our violent actions and America needs to leave the Korean Peninsula altogether. And somehow this passes. At which point America basically looks over and says, that's nice that you guys passed a little rule. Go ahead and try to enforce it. I dare you. Whatever you're thinking, you better think again. Otherwise I'm gonna have to head down there and I will rain down on a godly fucking firestorm upon you. You're gonna have to call the fucking United Nations. I am talking scorched earth, motherfucker. I will massacre you. I will fuck you up. All right, he's, he's like two for two with the like movie references today. I haven't seen Tropic Thunder in a million years. Meanwhile, inside the president's bunker, all kinds of crazy ideas are getting thrown around, some of which include bombarding the entire DMZ with artillery fire, using Navy SEALs and precision guided munitions to take out the North Korean barracks inside of the JSA, essentially killing all the North Koreans that had anything to do with this, destroying the Bridge of No Return, and my personal favorite, just dropping a nuclear bomb off the coast of North Korea just to prove a point. At this point, the president chimes in and he's like, no, no, this has to be an appropriate response. We don't want to overkill this situation and kick off World War III. So that begs the question, what is an appropriate response to the president? Well, that depends on the president. And the president at this particular time was none other than Gerald LBJ. Ford. Oh, Gerald you see, Ford. that's absolutely terrifying. And most of you have no idea why, because Gerald Ford doesn't have much brand recognition in modern times. So let me fill you in. Gerald Ford played college football at the university. Ooh, hello. He was a looker, wasn't he? Okay. ...of Michigan and had offers to go to the NFL from the Lions and the Green Bay Packers and turned both of them down because he wanted to be a boxing coach at Yale before he went into law school to become a politician. Somewhere along the way, this guy becomes friends with Richard Nixon. Fast forward, he's ready to retire. His friend Richard Nixon... Too bad what happened to his hair. His hair had really nice hair. ...is the president of the United States, and Richard Nixon's vice president, Spiro Agnew, gets accused of taking bribes and has to step down as vice president. At which point, Nixon calls up his old buddy and is like, hey, will you fill in as VP for me? So Gerald Ford, not wanting to let down his buddy, is like, sure, absolutely, I'll come be the vice president. So he serves as VP for a little bit, and then Watergate happens, I Richard Nixon fine. gets impeached, and Gerald Ford becomes the 38th president, president of the United States and the only president in American history that was never elected as VP or the president. Oh. <laughs> and the first thing he does wow. as president is he- Oh, I hadn't even thought of that. All right, that's baller. I feel like- Things I heard about the things that I know about Gerald Ford that I heard about later seems like he was pretty cool. Like, I feel like he and I kind of would have vibed maybe. I don't remember. I don't remember enough about him, honestly, because like, like he said, not a lot of brand recognition, but I feel like I remember him doing some stuff that I liked. He gives a presidential pardon to his buddy, Richard Nixon, oh, who just did got that. impeached so he can't go to prison. And this pisses off absolutely everybody. Left, right, middle, doesn't matter. Everybody is furious with Gerald Ford over this. There is a 0% chance that he is ever going to get reelected right out of the gate. All right, so just so we're all... Maybe that's what he wanted. He's like, I don't actually want this job. It seems kind of awful. The same page. President Gerald Ford, your traditional football playing, box and manly man that didn't want the job as president in the first place and has zero hopes of ever getting reelected, as well as having a history of being willing to sacrifice his personal image and the future of his career just to help out the homies. And we're going to find out what this man deems as an appropriate response. But one thing's for certain, and it is that that poplar tree is absolutely coming down. Fast forward three days later, August 21st, 7 a.m., a bunch of American and South Korean vehicles roll into the JSA, and Operation Paul Bunyan would officially begin. Inside of those vehicles, there is a 16-man tree trimming crew, and they are being escorted by two platoons of American grunts, roughly 60 guys, all carrying axe handles and pistols, ready to teach the North Koreans a lesson if they decide they want to try to stop them again. Now, is there supposed to be six 60 guys in the JSA carrying firearms. No, but they're just carrying pistols. It's the smallest gun Uncle Sam has to offer because America is trying very, very hard to be appropriate. Also, they brought a tank, which as you can see is basically- <laughs> Also, they brought a tank. <laughs> Jay Ford. Gerald Ford, my boy. My boy. <laughs> yeah, that's not a fire. Well, I mean, it's not a firearm. Technically speaking, 
that's not what it like right i think like to be a it's gotta be handheld right it's gonna be a firearm uh, i don't know i i filmed a video uh i watched a video with, about by brendan herrera once about like what is or what is not a firearm and i never actually posted it it will probably never see the light of day but i think i remember that basically a really small tank with a snow plow on the front and an enormous gun that's huge it's average okay that's pretty pathetic okay even if it is a little bit on the smaller side of average a single grain of rice can tip the scale and if that wasn't enough, they're also being backed up by 64 Black Berets, the South Korean Special Forces guys, one of which would actually go on to be the president of South Korea, Moon Jae-in. Okay, here's the deal with the Black Berets. As a minimum requirement, every single one of them has to be a black belt in Taekwondo. And I know what you're thinking. My nephew got a black belt in Taekwondo from the YMCA when he was like 13 years old. Big deal. Okay, I realize it's the same word. Trust me, it's not the same thing. These guys... Those tornado Taekwondo kicks not man not even gonna come into play because as all the vehicles pull up the 16 man tree trimming crew runs out they start cutting down the tree the americans get out with their pistols and their axe handles the south koreans pull up they get out and they start unstrapping something from the bottom of their vehicles against the orders of their president they had all snuck in m16s grenade launchers crew served weapons anti-tank weapons and some of them even had claymores strapped to their chest the south korean special forces has officially come to party at this point they're looking over at the americans like really oh yeah they brought the fucking favors baby the party poppers let's go and the americans are like we got shown up by some self what <laughs> what they brought the big guns we didn't think to do that we we thought well we brought we brought a tank we brought a tank you guys brought axe handles and pistols. What are you doing? Playing fucking Jenga? At this point, the Americans are like, hey, I appreciate the effort. You guys are awesome. That's great. But here's the deal. The only thing better than breaking the rules and getting away with it is not having to break the rules and still getting away with it. AKA, you just got to find that loophole and make them make new rules later because they didn't know that was an option. You see, they told us we can't have guns in the JSA. They didn't say anything about above the JSA. Because circling overhead, there is 20 Huey utility helicopters, and on those helicopters is an entire company of American there it is. infantry. There it is. I knew it. <laughs> I was like, like, I knew it. <laughs> of course they did. Roughly 120 19-year-old athletic alcoholics with machine guns, and as soon as those helicopters touch down, they are ready to get out and start kicking ass. But here's the deal with that. It wouldn't be appropriate to send out a bunch of utility helicopters without a security escort, so they're being accompanied by seven Cobra attack helicopters. And just in case that's not enough, above that there is somewhere between 12 and 20 B-52 Strato fortresses that just got in from Guam that are now doing hot laps around the entire d -Milli militarized zone, each of which is carrying like 70,000 pounds worth of bombs, some of which were allegedly <laughs> nuclear warheads. In addition to that, there is an entire fighter squadron of American F-4 Phantoms that just got in from Okinawa, and oh a bunch of God. South Korean F-5s, as well as a bunch of American F-111s that just got in from Idaho. In addition to that, there's roughly 10,000 oh my God, there's standby just inside the South Korean border, ready to run in if they're needed, and on top of that, there's another 12,000 troops already en route to South Korea, just in case. Oh. You're playing with the big boys now. That's where he sh that's the one he should have done. <laughs> Good God. Of course they did. I mean, I'm very impressed with the South Koreans and I love this screenshot of him right now. But I <laughs> I love them really like they snuck in their guns. And the Americans were like, we didn't really even have to sneak them in cuz There we go. <laughs> Sneaky assholes. Of course they did that. Oh, and now the USS Midway, a fucking aircraft carrier, and her entire security detail are parked off the North Korean coast. And all of this was done in the span of three days. America has probably just conducted the greatest showing of force ever and turned this poplar tree into the largest game of fuck around and find out in human history. Cut back to the men on the ground. Operation Paul Bunyan has been going on for approximately five minutes. The five longest minutes in human history of an entire army watching 16 
dudes trim a tree and not a single sign of a North Korean anywhere, which is really weird. Normally they would have been here by now. What is going on? At this point, the American leadership comes to the realization that the North Koreans know exactly what's going on. There's a 0% chance that they don't. And they have decided that their best option is to not show up at all. And then later on, they're going to play it off. Like they had no idea the entire thing actually happened, making it appear as though America's show of force was not that big of a deal. At this point, the American leadership mm. takes a deep breath and they're like, okay, we have to keep this appropriate. We're the bigger people in this. That's a great PR move by the North Koreans. Doesn't matter. We know what we did. We know what we accomplished. And that should be enough. I'm just kidding. The American leadership immediately sent a transmission to the North Koreans telling them that they were there for, and I quote, to finish the work left unfinished. <laughs> Now, the North Korean frontline communications just go absolutely nuts. We know this because American intelligence was monitoring their frontline communications. And, and like laughing hysterically the whole time. One of the intel analysts that was listening said, and I quote, this move blew their fucking minds. At this point, the North Koreans are absolutely terrified, but they have to do something because they've got way too much pride not to. So all of the North Korean troops in the immediate area are ordered to go to the Bridge of No Return. Within a matter of minutes, a bunch of trucks pull up on the other side of the Bridge of No Return and 150 North Korean soldiers get out and they proceed to stand there and watch silently for what I presume to be the longest 35 minutes of their entire lives as they watch the Americans finish cutting down this tree. And that's pretty much it. The Americans finished trimming this tree. They left a big ass stump there so the North Koreans never ever forgot about it. And then once that stump rotted away, they put a plaque there in honor of the two soldiers that lost their lives, Lieutenant Mark Barrett and Captain Arthur Boniface. North Korea was then also ordered to pay reparations to their family members. In addition to that, the North Koreans issued a statement saying the entire situation was regrettable, which according to the experts is the closest thing to an apology that you will ever get out of the North Koreans. And then to absolutely everybody's surprise, on August 25th, the North Koreans come back to the negotiating table and they're like, hey, remember that idea you guys have had for like the last 20 years where you wanted to split the JSA in half to separate North and South Korean forces? so a bunch of dumb shit didn't happen. Yeah, we think we'd finally like to do that. So yeah, in conclusion, I guess this has been the story about how World War III almost got started by a tree. Thank you for watching. Best way to support the channel is go buy some merch over at thefatelectrician.com. Quack bang out. These military operation ones keep getting weirder and weirder. I should probably they talk do. about that time that America accidentally turned a manhole cover into the fastest man-made object of all time because they yeeted it into outer space with a nuclear warhead. I mean, I feel like he just told that story quite well and efficiently. I bet they did. I will always believe when the American military slash government does something ridiculous. <laughs> I will always, always believe it. Or when they, when they're oh, over, out proportional, when they blow something out of proportion, I'll always believe that too. Um, but that was pretty freaking funny. Again, I feel like maybe later Gerald Ford did some, maybe it was after his presidency. I feel like either he was cool or he was garbage and I can't remember which. So you'll have to let me know if he was cool or if he was garbage. <laughs> um, like as a president and like, I mean, he pardoned Nixon, which I don't know. I don't care. Um, any, you know, I was, I was nowhere close to being born. Um, so I, whatever. I haven't really looked into that as deeply as I could have. Um, but I kind of think that he shouldn't have pardoned Nixon just based on we needed some kind of precedent. We didn't think we'd need it, but you know, anyway. Um, but anyway, <laughs> that was fun. And again, his, his uh, use of, of movie clips in that was pretty masterful. I very much appreciated uh, both Mulan and Tropic Thunder. <laughs> um, and uh, let me know what I should react to next. And I'll see you in the next video.